Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. I'm so excited for this guest today. Marsha Clark is a name that many know very well from the trial of the century, a century ago, <laughs> way back in the 20th century. In 1995, famed NFL player and actor O.J. Simpson was tried for the murders of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and her friend, Ronald Goldman. The trial created a full-on media circus with around-the-clock coverage like this country had never seen before. At the center of it all was lead prosecutor Marsha Clark of the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office. Over the course of that eight-month trial, she and her fellow prosecutor, Christopher Darden, gave their best efforts to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the guilt of O.J. Simpson in committing these two murders. They faced off against a team of defense lawyers, including Robert Shapiro, Johnny Cochran, F. Lee Bailey, Robert Kardashian. Uh, later, our pal Alan Dershowitz would join. Known as the Dream Team, Dersh says he now refers to it as the Nightmare Team. Cochran was in the lead role, and he rendered this famous standout line in closing arguments. Like the defining moment in this trial, the day Mr. Darden asked Mr. Simpson to try on those gloves, and the gloves didn't fit. Remember these words. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Amazing. So, so well done. I mean, even if you disagree with the verdict, you can't take that away from Johnny Cochran. And we all remember what happened next. O.J. did indeed try putting on the glove. It did not fit. It was the moment Marcia says she knew they had lost the case. It has been more than 20 years since the O.J. case ended in an acquittal. But the trial continues to capture the attention of the nation. It lives on in pop culture through TV shows, music, movies, documentaries. And many are still asking questions on the result of the verdict, intense media frenzy, and what life was like for those involved after the trial. And what the trial and our obsession with it says about us. Like many of us, I am eating healthier. And that is why I love good olive oil. It is blessed under the No Hateful Eight program that we've been going over. Olive oil, you're all good. And by good, I mean it is fresh and it is delicious. Olive oil packs the most flavor and the healthiest nutrients when it's fresh from the farm. And that is the problem with supermarket olive oils. They're not fresh. They can sit on the shelf for months growing stale. That is why I love my new olive oil. I'm getting it now direct from small, award-winning farms thanks to a guy named T.J. Robinson, also known as the Olive Oil Hunter. When I tasted T.J.'s Farm Fresh oils, I fell in love with their vibrant flavors. They are incredibly delicious on salad, veggies, pasta, meat, fish, you name it. As an introduction to his fresh-pressed olive oil club, T.J. will send you a full-size 39 bottle $39 bottle of one of the world's finest artisanal olive oils, fresh from the new harvest for just $1. Okay, for just $1, you're going to get this to help him cover shipping. Best of all, with TJ's Club, there is never a commitment to buy anything now or ever, and you can cancel your membership at any time. Okay, so you're going to get a $39 bottle for just $1 shipping and taste the difference that the freshness makes. You're going to love it. Truly. I've been cooking with it every night. Go to harvestfreshnow.com. Harvestfreshnow.com for that free bottle. All it's going to cost you is $1 to cover the shipping. Harvestfreshnow.com. Marsha Clark has a fascinating life story, one that goes well beyond her role as lead prosecutor in that case. Uh, there was her role as a working mother. She became somewhat iconic for pushing back on, remember Lance Ito, the judge, who was trying to shame her for her long, her refusal to work after hours, and she was not having it. <laughs> and life now, including her career as an author of successful crime uh, novels. There is so much more to get to, and I'm thrilled to have her on the show with us today. This is my first time meeting and talking to the one and only Marsha Clark. Marsha, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to meet you, it's a pleasure. Uh Oh my gosh, you, you have to understand. I'm sure you've heard this many times, but to me, you really are a heroine. I, I was in law school while you were trying this case. I was in my oh, wow. third year of law school watching you and dying to be a prosecutor. 
And I had this weird thing at the time. As I've had it ever since. I don't know. There's some. There's like a weird theory on the internet that somehow Nicole Brown Simpson and I are the same person or that I'm her reincarnated. I don't know what their theory is. But uh, there's just weird tentacles between me and this case. But I was obsessed with you. I was like, I want to be just like her. Win or lose, you were amazing. So it's truly thrilling to meet you. Oh, thank you so much, Megan. I'm a big fan too. So oh, oh. mutual society here. But oh um, yeah. That's crazy. You were in law school at the time, and yeah. yet you finished law school and became a lawyer anyway. Yes. <laughs> well, you know what? And I, I, I wanted to be a, a prosecutor so badly. I never went to law school thinking I wanted to be a lawyer. I just wanted to be a prosecutor. That's all. And it yeah. wasn't until I amassed my hundred grand in debt and saw what they pay you in the New York City District Attorney's <laughs> Office, where I was yes. like, oh, man, I need another dream. <laughs> So I went private It's terrifying, practice. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So respect, respect, because I know it doesn't pay well and it's scary and you take a lot of negative incoming, but you believe you're on the side of the angels when you take a job like this. And, the, and one of the fun things in reading your book and getting, you know, sort of boning up on your backstory is a lot of people go to the DA's office and then leave and go make a bunch of money in the private sector as these white shoe criminal defense lawyers. You actually started as a defense lawyer, a criminal defense lawyer. And I love the story. Basically, after not too long, you, your boss is like, you might consider joining the other side. You seem a little better suited. <laughs> so tell us about that. So it was a it was a um, a double murder plus attempted murder case and um, involving a pretty well-known criminal uh, head of a, a gang. And um, there were flaws in the evidence. And I had to write the motion to dismiss at the uh, preliminary hearing. And I thought, you know, if the judge actually follows the law, uh, this case gets dismissed. And I, I thought, but, you know, it's a preliminary hearing. The standard of proof is low. Uh, we'll probably get through, be fine. And so I didn't even want to go to court with my boss. He presented the motion and came back and said, Marsha, congratulations. We won, case dismissed. And I went, oh, shit. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, Okay, we can refile, uh, and maybe you want to be a DA. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You and can come back as the prosecutor on this case. Yeah, because <laughs> it's one of those things where, I don't know, You now you get shame for being a DA and putting people in jail like it's somehow inherently bad. But I remember being in law school, and even then, not understanding how criminal defense attorneys could do what they do. Now I have yeah. a better appreciation. I see very clearly their critical role, but I couldn't do it. I could not do it. I'm much more prosecution oriented like you. So you wind up, what was it, three years out of law school working for the LA district attorney or how many, how many years of law school? Yeah. Uh-huh. There, no more. Let me think. Hold on. I don't know about, about two and a half, three years out yeah. of law school. Um, went to the DA's office and remained there until, you know, after the trial. Yeah. Now, before we get to all that, let's talk about a little bit of backstory because it's interesting to get to know you. I understand you were born in California, but you were raised kind of all over. Tell us a little bit about how you bounced around. Yeah, so I was born in Berkeley, and then we moved all over the place um, pretty much until I was a senior in high school. And so we lived in Tacoma, Washington. We lived in Texas. We lived in um, Michigan. We lived in uh, Maryland. We lived in New York. Wow. Why, and then why came was back. that? Pardon? Why was that? Oh, my father was the director of the Food and Drug Administration. So he kept getting promoted and every promotion came with a transfer. So we were, we bounced around a lot and then wound up back in Los Angeles. So, and then I stayed here. You know, okay. I, I actually really loved New York. I did not want to leave. Um, and I really thought I would move back, but then. I went to college and then I got, you know what I mean? Life kind of yeah. took hold and life was here. And so I stayed here. Now, there was something in your past that you revealed in your book that I didn't know about. And I do think it had a role in you becoming a prosecutor. And it must have made the trial of OJ, you know, just to have a few more stakes for you personally than the average prosecutor. And that was you yourself became a crime victim at age 17. Right. So that was um, during a trip out of the country, and I really, um, I think I was just incredibly naive, but I was raped. Um, it was a pretty violent rape, 
And um, that was, I remember walking into the ocean and thinking I was going to kill myself because I didn't think I could stand myself. You know, there was a way in which I was so devastated and felt like I had been used up and thrown out. And it was um, pretty bad. And the very last moment, water up to here, I said, you wait a minute. And I got mad. <laughs> and I said, mm-hmm. I'm not doing this. And for the longest time, I actually, it was almost immediately thereafter, blocked out the memory completely and pretended it never happened. Mm-hmm. Um, but I kept having horrible dreams about it. Um, and so it didn't go away. But ultimately, I did wind up dealing with it very shortly after I became a prosecutor. So none of this was conscious. But what happened was I was um, just joined the office. I was had been a DA for, what, maybe three, four months. And I was handling preliminary hearings. And a woman who was a rape victim came in and she, she only wanted to have a woman prosecutor. And so I took the case. And I remember just sitting outside and talking and um, she was she was just a wonderful person, wonderful woman. And I felt so badly for her um, on within it's the weirdest. It must be just a coincidence. But within hours, I was so sick. I had a fever. I had the shakes. I was a mess. And the defense attorney looked at me in court and said, you better go home. I went home. I was sick. Um, but then realized that it was stirring up a memory and it was the memory of my own rape and so you know finally dealt with it finally acknowledged what had happened um and her case went well um as far as i know i finished the preliminary hearing certainly he was held to answer i believe he was convicted um and i do think that impacted my ability to um empathize and understand i think especially back then which was the stone age Rape was still something they looked at the woman and said, what did you do? What were you wearing? What did you say? How did you act? And um, the ability to to hand to, you know, look back at my own life and what did I do and realize I was blaming myself um, for uh, for simply saying hello to someone, (laughs) being nice to someone and realize Mm -hmm. that this is bullshit. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that did help add a layer of empathy and understanding that um, I might not have otherwise had. Certainly it made me um, even more proud of being a prosecutor, being able to help people that way. Yeah, I I understand. I, I feel like looking at the arc of your career, I mean, not to not to be brazen about it, but I feel like your own experience as a crime victim made you somewhat of a warrior for uh, for other women who have gone through that and worse, you joined what what I understand is essentially kind of like a special victims unit at all. It was special trials unit or describe the unit that you were in for 10 years. So that was my goal was to get into the special trials unit. Very, very. So the DA's office had several units, hardcore gangs, sexual violence. Now they had they had family violence. Um, uh, uh, each one was a different you know specialty. But there was one very small unit of only at that time five. Uh, attorneys, five DAs that handled all the high profile cases. So the um, Night Stalker was there. Um, the Onion Field would have been there. It would, it, it just all of the, the high profile, mm. you know, big, it, all, all murder, pretty much all murder cases. So and then, the so at some point, I'm sorry. That's the A team for sure. And it's also people yeah. who have to be able to take the scrutiny of the media watching every single move. Little did you know, <laughs> just how much. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> right. He's like, oh, sure. That might be fun. No. Oh, wait. <laughs> well, <laughs> but back then, Megan, the media scrutiny was nothing. I mean, it was nothing. They would show up. Maybe the, the pre- when we say the press, then we're talking newspapers, uh, mm-hmm. physical newspapers. And they would show up with maybe a camera and your picture the DA's picture would never be in the camera, be in the frame ever. It was just the, the defendant. And if they spelled your name right, it was amazing. If they spelled you, can spelled your name at all. So that was the the media coverage back then. They'd oh show up God. at the arraignment. They'd show up maybe in somewhere in the middle and then at the verdict. And that was that. And so uh, there was no worry about media scrutiny. It was just you know, you're just doing these big cases. And the real challenge of them was that they went so long. I mean, we're talking 
one of the trials took two years and being in trial for two years straight was so intense and crazy. Mm. It was really weird at the end of the case within about a week of it finally being over. I was, lo- I realized I was losing hair and I was freaking out like what's going on. <laughs> oh my yeah. God. Wake up, find hair on my pillow. And one of the other lawyers in the unit said, it's stress. It'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I remember when I was practicing law, which is an incredibly stressful profession, unlike media, which is a walk in the park. Um, (laughs) uh, But I remember when I was practicing law, uh, hearing the stats about like the average life expectancy in America. And it's still that um, women are expected to outlive men. For the most part, women have a longer life expectancy. And I remember thinking, these are not lawyers. These women are not lawyers. Like there's no way we haven't worked our way over into the short lifespan category as female lawyers. It's just too <laughs> stressful. And I didn't have anything like the law career that you had. So I can only imagine. And in the meantime, you're trying to raise two kids and you're going through a divorce and all that would come out during the OJ trial as well, what, what you were going through. So let's talk before we get to OJ. You, you were the prosecutor on another case, which I happen to know a fair amount about um, because I... I too am a crime victim, really. I, I was stalked very badly by a very deranged person uh, who Oof. wound up being going into jail and a mental facility for a decade for what he did to me. And um, th- th- so I boned up very quickly on stalking and stalking cases. And when does one get a restraining order? And what are the risks of doing that? And blah, blah, blah. And that's when Gavin DeBecker first came into my life, who I know you talked to on this case I'm about to get to. And we just had him on the show a couple months ago. Um, And the case was the prosecution of Robert Bardo, who killed, stalked and killed a famous actress at the time by the name of Rebecca Schaefer. And this did make national headlines. It was horrific. For those who aren't familiar with the case, let me just show you Rebecca Schaefer. She was starring in a show called My Sister Sam with Pam Dauber of Mork and Mindy fame. And um, she was young. She was like 20, 21 years old. I'm going to show you the clip and then Marsha Clark will tell us what happened. Here it is. What's wrong? Nobody takes me seriously. Nobody thinks I can solve a complex emotional problem. Okay, I have a problem you can solve. My apartment looks like Macy's in hell. (laughs) You just hate my stuff, Sam. Oh, here we go. What? I have learned to live with your stuff. You think it's fun living with someone who saves jars? (laughs) Uh-huh. So, so there actually was kind of a resemblance between the two of them. And I know yeah. Pam Dauber took this whole, what happened to Rebecca very hard personally. So tell us what happened with Robert Bardo, the, the man who killed Rebecca Schaefer. So that I did not know until um, a couple of days. I didn't immediately know it was a stalking case. It was a murder case um, that I was given to try. And it was, my first introduction to this kind of stalking where it was the kind of stalking I had heard of and knew about as a DA was boyfriend stalking ex-girlfriends, you know, and, and it was a personal connection that had gone sour and then they were doing what they could to pay back the other side. But this notion of stalking a celebrity you've never met uh, or maybe only met in a crowd of fans um, was something new to me. And so fairly early on in the case, as I was investigating, um, Gavin DeBecker called and I did not know uh, him other than I had heard about his name in connection. I believe it was with the Teresa Saldana case. She was another actress who had been stalked and he attempted to murder her, did not. She survived. And so I, I had I had some idea that he was an expert in this field. So we started to talk and it was revelatory. I mean, I think Gavin's a genius and we spent hours and hours and hours and hours on the phone as he was traveling and doing all kinds of different cases and working, um, answering my questions about stalkers, about their mentality, about what, why this happens, how this happens and, and how do we prevent it by the way? And how do we keep people safe? In addition to, of course, um, what the prosecution, the shape of the prosecution, because he went to Park Dietz, who used to work with Gavin, who is a psychiatrist, psychi- psychiatrist, psychologist, 
Now I can't remember, mm-hmm. but that was his point of view was going to be that Robert Bardo did not premeditate the murder, that he did not intend to kill, that he, it was a rash impulse, et cetera. Um, which I knew, I believed to be, um, bullshit. So, mm-hmm. Uh, there was a lot of discussion and a lot of preparation uh, with that in mind. But I learned a great deal about the stalking mentality as a result of my collaboration with Gavin uh, during that case. Yeah. It was such the most, one of the most incredibly tragic of circumstances where you have this entirely innocent victim who did nothing but be kind to someone. And this was what happened. This, this was her reward was, yeah. you know, she opens the door and. He shoots her. It was horrifying. He shot her through the heart. She she truly had had no contact with him. He hired a private investigator to track right. down her address. He got it. He showed up there. She answered her own door. She, I think, gave him a, uh, an autograph, um, or so- something to that effect, like on, on the spot, and then closed the door. And um, And then he came back and knocked mm-hmm. again, and she opened the door again, and he shot her through the heart killing her they call yeah. this kind of stalker an erotomaniac and it's somebody basically who has no connection with you but in his head believes that you have some sort of a essentially a love connection in my case the, the guy thought that i was sending him messages because the number one rule is don't communicate with your stalker do not communicate right. with your stalker and so even signing the autograph is potentially dangerous and i've heard you say you learn from gavin saying anything more than the autograph isn't the next level of danger you know like all best or Mm-hmm. love, you know, whatever, just, just, just your name is sufficient. Um, but, but if you, if my stalker believed that he, I was communicating to him through the president's ties, through my hand motions on television, through things that Sean Hannity was saying on, on his show, like I had nothing to do with me, even if I had gone off the air, he was believing that I was sending him messages. So it was constant contact quote, quote you know, air quotes from me t- to the stalker. And that's terrible and it's dangerous and it's why we took it so seriously and it did escalate and, and it was bad. But in her case, she signed an autograph. The guy got it in his head that there was some connection between them and he shot her and she died. Um, and so you had to prosecute this guy with his team being like, look, he was he didn't form premeditation. You know, he showed up there. Obviously, there's something wrong with Robert Bardo. Come on, everybody can see that. And you managed to get around that. As I understand it, like you he sort of submitted some demonstration of how the alleged encounter actually yeah. happened. And you saw yeah. holes in that demonstration that nobody else saw. Yeah. So what happened is he, they videotaped his session with the, the doctor with Park Dietz in which the doctor asked him questions about his state of mind and then asked him, you know, how did it happen? Show me what happened. And so I'm watching him reenact and I'm, it's like something bumped me that that's weird rewind what's bothering me rewind (laughs) and then i realized what it was he was showing that he approached her door and he had his hand behind his back and as she opened the door he he as yeah as he opened the door he pulls out the gun and then shoots her and i thought oh my god (laughs) that's an ambush that's premeditation he came to the door prepared he had the gun behind his back and so i was able to prove that this was a a killing by means of lying in wait which is a special circumstance and gets you life without the possibility of parole so the argument was no he wasn't hiding behind the bushes but my argument legally was you do not have to hide behind a door behind the bushes and be physically obscured as long as your purpose is obscured and that you lure somebody in by appearing to be harmless and then, but you're prepared to kill. Mm-hmm. And um, the judge bought it. The Court of Appeals bought it. Um, and he is now doing life without parole. Good. You know, this reminds me of something. I, I moved last year. My family and I moved from New York, where I've spent my 51 years, to Connecticut. And I got a driver's license. And, you know, re- they ask you if you want to register to vote when you get your driver's license. And I said, sure. Yeah, of course. And so you had to put down your address. And it, my registration, right, and I hadn't, I've never done this because I, since I became a public figure, and because thankfully, television career, so I learned very quickly, holy crap, you really have to bend over backwards to protect yourself. So um, I wasn't about to put my home address on my license because it's very easily discoverable. And then 
I, long story short, was rejected. My registration to vote was rejected because I had put down a P.O. box. And they were like, you can only register to vote if you put down your home address. I said, well, what if my P.O. box is, you know, nearby my home? You know, to make sure I'm not in a different jurisdiction. I understand that. Nope. We need your actual home address for you to vote in Connecticut. I'm like, this is insane. There are, forget people who are well-known thanks to television like me. There are all these billionaire hedge fund, you know, movers and shakers who bad guys want to kidnap. They want to kidnap their kids who have serious concerns about letting their public address get out there. And it's not just Connecticut, Connecticut, L.A. and California are leading the pack on protecting public figures from this because of people like you, because of cases like this, you know, because there's a lot of celebrities living there. But the average state is like mine, where you you can, you lose your privilege to vote unless you're willing to reveal exactly to the world where you live, your exact home, where your children are, where you, it's really wrong. Yeah. Yeah, it is really wrong. And they need to find a way. I mean, and consider someone who's not famous, who's not rich, who doesn't have the means even to explore how to do this. I mean, if it's just a woman whose ex-husband is going after her and she's moved to be safe and to keep her children safe, she doesn't have access to whatever it takes to do this extra layer of confidentiality. It's not so easy. Yeah. So, I mean, California does have these means and they have special means of uh, registration so that you can vote. But a lot of places don't. And I really think this should be a national thing that is required because in order to vote, you should not have to surrender your safety in order to vote. That's just ridiculous. Yeah. And think about it. So you're basically legislating crime victims out of the voting rolls. Yeah. <laughs> By yeah. having this policy, it's yeah. like what? What sense does that make? I, uh, well, I'm going to call you one of these days to get you to help me to change the law in Connecticut because it's it's ridiculous, and they really just. I'd be happy haven't. to. Yeah, thank you. They haven't. They, they, how could they resist the two of us? <laughs> Good luck. I don't know, but you know what? <laughs> Here we come. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So all of this is just by way of background to show you you had had a young lifetime of understanding crime from both sides uh, of trying to do what's right against very bad actors and being fearless in the face of massive challenges and putting them behind bars. And then along comes the O.J. Simpson case. And I love the fact that, like me, you're not really a sports person, apparently. And so when you first got the very first call about this, they said, do you, do you know who O.J. Simpson is? And your answer was no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did. No, I knew, you knew Naked who he was. Gun. <laughs> oh, you knew Naked Gun? <laughs> You didn't know, like, the Bills or the 49ers or the Heisman oh, Trophy. No. That, no. What are those? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I didn't so, know any. <laughs> so can I tell you, in advance of this interview, I was I, I watched a little bit of um, The People versus O.J. Simpson, you know, with Sarah Paulson as you. And um, I was trying to explain to the kids, they don't know who O.J. Simpson is. And um, I, I said, it, it, this would be kind of like if Tom Brady got arrested. Tom Brady's in a loving marriage with his wife, Giselle. But I'm just saying this would be like somebody like Tom Brady got accused of murdering his spouse or somebody very close to him. Like that's how famous O.J. Simpson was. And and the other thing, Marsha, you tell me, but like the other thing I see similarity between those two guys, with all due respect to Tom, please, is um, beloved, almost universally beloved. Of course, not by sports rivals, but just as a personality in America. Oh, yeah. O.J. Simpson actually had another layer to it um, that I learned throughout the case or learned very early on in the case. He was somebody who came up from very hard scrabble life. You know, I mean, this was a very rough childhood that he had for many, many reasons. And so he's a success story in, in the sense that he overcame huge odds to become uh, as famous as he was. And I mean, as, as incredibly accomplished and talented as a sports figure as he was. I mean, I ultimately came to wound up watching the footage of his um, early career when they came out with the 30 for 30 piece. I don't know if piece. you got to see that. That game, was wasn't a great it? piece. Yeah. I thought it was amazing. And watching him play and going, holy shit, he's a, mm. you know, phenom. He's a phenom. So there was this kind of, and, and then, of course, there's the racial aspect where, you know, I mean, he's overcome the odds of being a black man in a, in a world that was made it a lot harder to be than I think it is today, though it's far from perfect. So I think it was really 
these there were so there was so much to his persona and what he achieved that made him uh, an, an, an incredible icon for so so many. And he mm-hmm. he was a very charming guy. I mean, That's he really great. had enormous charisma. You know, you watch him in the thirty for thirty as he's talking straight to camera and and so self deprecating and so charming. I, I get it. Uh, I get why he was as big as he was. Mm. Even um, in the you know the the docudrama People versus O.J. Simpson, um, they're showing like after the white Bronco chase. He's he's getting out, and the first thing he says to the cops is, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry," and he's saying to them on the phone, "I, I know you just, you want to go home to your kids." You know that's that was most of America's impression of him: he, kind, yes. care, caring about others, like you say, self-deprecating. You know this sort of gentle giant who overcame incredible odds to become a- America's hero, and and mm-hmm. unlike some of these celebrities, no drunken tapes that we knew at that point of him right. being belligerent or an ass or saying a bunch of terrible things. You know, I'm thinking of like Mel Gibson, you know, like just no, nothing. It was just yeah. universally beloved guy. So yeah. you go into this thing as the audience, as the people, as the jury pool thinking, nah, nah, not this guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Back then, um, there were still not the ubiquitous iPhones and, you know, cameras that people had in their pockets and, you know, a- abilities to record. And so there were quite a few celebrities who were not all that they seemed. And they could be not all that they seemed um, and get away with it without people finding out that they were actually mm-hmm. behind the scenes. Not so great, um, as we later learned uh, way too many times <laughs> since then. Um, so he, people didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know the good or the bad. Honestly, I came into it so very neutral. Um, but I just didn't know enough about him to, to know that I should feel one way or another. So when, you know, when all of this started coming out, it was a revelation to everyone, a bigger one for those who had this really great impression of him that they defined, they discovered for the first time he'd been beating Nicole. He had, there were some reports did come out about beating his first wife, that he was actually kind of a boorish guy, uh, really, and treated Nicole very, very badly um, in very ugly ways, a very a spousal abuser. He was, you know, a, a classic spousal abuser. And then the tapes came out that you could hear him yelling at her, She's pregnant and he's calling her a fat pig. I mean, it was just disgusting one thing after another, but it all got, it was all remained very quiet because she didn't want to, she really didn't want to prosecute. Uh, The only one time she did, um, the National Enquirer reported it, but no one else picked up the story. So no one really knew. And all of this just started to come out because of the criminal, because of the murders. Otherwise, no one would ever have found out. Yeah, I mean, tell the audience what Denise Brown, her her sister, said when she found out that Nicole had been murdered. Oh, she said he did it. I knew it. He did it. And she was like right away, um, right on top of it. And she saw it coming. But she, you know, was behind the scenes with them. They would, you know, have dinner together, spend time together. She had reason to know that he was not the great guy uh, yeah. that you saw on TV. Mm, it's chilling. Um, yeah. Marsha mentions the 911 calls that you know, if you followed this trial at all, you, you've you heard. Uh, well, that's how she began the case, the people versus O.J. Simpson, on the, on the subject of his domestic violence against his wife of seven years. Uh, here's one of those 911 tapes, and then we'll go to break and have more with Marsha uh, right after this. Listen to this 911 call as we go out. Emergency Can you get someone over here now to 325 Gretna Green? He's back. Please. Well, okay, what does he look like? He's O.J. Simpson. I think you know his record. Could you just send somebody okay. over here? Okay, what is he doing there? He just drove up again. He just <laughs> drove up. over. Okay, wait a minute. What kind of car is he in? He's in a white Bronco, but first of all, he broke the back door down to get in. Before. Okay, wait a minute. What's your name? Nicole Simpson. Okay, is he the sportscaster or whatever? Yeah. Okay. Thank what is, you. Wait a minute. We're sending the police. What is he doing? Is he threatening you? I'm going nuts. Okay. Has he threatened you in any way, or or is he just harassing you? 
You're going to hear him in a minute. He's about to come in again. Okay, just stay on the line. I don't want to stay on the line. He's going to beat the shit Wait a minute, wait. Just stay on the line so we can know what's going on until the police get there, okay? Mm. We'll be right back. Don't go away. More with Marsha Clark. Are the high fuel costs putting a damper on your summer vacation plans? From higher prices at the pump to a jump in airfare, it's getting more expensive to get away for a week. But what if you could soak up all those vacation vibes year round? Get a Michael Phelps Swim Spa by Master Spas. Whether you want to stay close to home this summer or just want to extend your break, a Michael Phelps Swim Spa by Master Spas can transform your backyard into an oasis. It combines the benefits of a pool with the therapy of a hot tub. This will reinvent family time. You'll love it, and your family and friends will love it too. Michael Phelps Swim Spas by Master Spas come in a variety of sizes to complement almost any yard, even if it's a small backyard. And since it is heated, you can use it year-round in any climate. Michael Phelps Swim Spas are 100% made in the USA by Master Spas, the world's largest swim spa manufacturer. Go to masterspas.com, put in the promo code MK, and that will save you $1,000 on a Michael Phelps Swim Spa or $500 on a Master Spas hot tub. That's masterspas.com, promo code MK. So, Marsha, um, the the LADA and the uh, police were investigating O.J. Simpson. There, there was a line to the effect of, we went over there to notify him that his ex-wife had been murdered. We didn't expect to watch him become a suspect before our very eyes. It was a trail of blood leaving, leading from Nicole's house to his house. I mean, the truth is, O.J. was a terrible criminal. He, he really did leave, and, and, and I, obviously I'm showing my bias, I 100% believe that he did this. Um, but he left a trail of blood from the murders back to his own house, and the only way this was discounted at trial was, well, there were a couple of different ways. The defense got up there and tried to suggest the L.A. cops had planted the whole thing. There was some chemical in the blood that they said showed the L.A. Pol- police had had to have manipulated it, and they played the race card. Um, and as as I think it was Robert Shapiro would later say, they played it from the bottom of the deck. So um, before we get to all that, you say, all right, let's get him. We're going to arrest him. We have plenty. And then he flees. <laughs> he flees. Robert Shapiro says, I'm going br- I'm, I'm to bring him in. Fear not. He doesn't bring him in. He goes with his friend, AC, um, Al Cowling, in a different white Bronco. OJ owned one. So did his friend, AC. And before we knew it, 100 million Americans at a time when, as you point out, like we didn't have an iPhone that could just pop up and beep and say, oh, my God, turn on your TV. Somehow we all just got word. Get in front of your TV. Oh, my God. A hundred million Americans watched this. This is SOT 4. No report on anything other than police staying, keeping a clear distance behind. There's no rule book on this because... Right here, Pat. This hasn't happened. Yeah, it it seems to be that way. And uh, the traffic up above is still... uh, In fact, I'm trying to look down through my uh, lower window... It appears that CHP has stopped uh, traffic uh, on the on-ramps coming onto the 91 westbound just to let the, uh, the officers proceed uh, at, a, at a nice uh, pace coming through here. Again, they don't want anything to happen uh, to this uh, suspect vehicle. They want to try to keep it as safe as possible. But uh, there's definitely a crowd growing on every uh, overpass that we see, vehicles and people that want to get a glimpse and see if uh, this is, in fact, OJ coming down the, uh, the freeway. 911, what are you reporting? This is this is AC. I have OJ in the car. Okay, where are you? Please, I'm coming up the five freeway. Okay. Right now we all we are okay, but you gotta tell the police to just back off. He's still alive, but he got a gun to his head. Is everything else okay? Everything right now is okay, officer. Everything is okay. All about he wants to me to get it to his mom. He wants me to get it to his house. Okay. So that's all I. That's all we ask. He got a gun to his head. Okay. Mr. What what's your name? My name. You know who I am, God damn it. Oh my God. What did we learn from the slow moving white Bronco chase? Oh man. So <laughs> trigger. Yeah. <laughs> no, what yeah, a little bit triggering. So the nine one one tape from Nicole was more triggering, let me tell you. Um mm-hmm. that's just harrowing. That it's just heartbreaking. Um but watching that again. I'm struck by a few things. Number one thing, 
I'm talking to the two lead detectives in the case. Um, they have just arrested him, as far as I know. Um, they contacted him as he came home from the airport. And um, as far as I knew, he was in handcuffs and he was at the station and they were interviewing him. And then they came in to talk to me and I was going to ask and I wanted to find out what did he say, you know, and, and how did he react? And uh, they told me basically uh, it was a non-confession. <laughs> it was kind of a sliding all over the place, which, you know, happens. Um, it's actually pretty rare that a defendant says, uh, you got me, I did it. So, okay. Mm. I said, okay, so um, where'd you book him? And he goes, well, we didn't. What do you mean you, you didn't? Well, they booked him, but they released him. You released him. What, why would you, what, why would you do that? We have, we by, even by then had a mountain of evidence. I mean, it was insane the amount of evidence, as you put it. So rightly, Megan, he was a terrible criminal. He did not do a very good job of this. He left mm -hmm. evidence everywhere, leading right up to his bedroom. I mean, inside his bedroom. It was ridiculous. How could you possibly let him go? And they said, oh, where can he go? He's O.J. Simpson. Everybody's going to recognize him. And I was flabbergasted. And of course, then that allowed the Bronco slow chase to happen, um, which I think was a galvanizing moment for a lot of people. Um, it, it became kind of this rolling a snowball effect of people um, watching and jumping on and then going out to cheer and going, you know, it just kind of this mania took hold and it became a cause to stand up for don't squeeze the juice kind of thing, mm -hmm. which I don't know would have happened had he gone into custody as you would have with any other person, any other defendant, you name them. They would have been in custody after all the evidence that we had, because of course he'd be a flight risk. And he knows how much evidence there was. There's all kinds of news reports. People are talking about it endlessly. It was hard to miss. So that they let him go at that point for reasons I still don't understand, but, uh, and then let him stay out for as long as they did. Uh, again, I think a lot of that had to do with a previous case, uh, and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds with this, but it had to do with the Michael Jackson case and the the beef that the police department had with our office for not filing charges and for in endlessly investigating him up in Santa Barbara and convening the grand jury for as long as we did and then never bringing charges. Um, and I think they were afraid that might happen here, um, although the difference between the two cases was so stark it was ridiculous yeah nevertheless it caused this kind of feeling of mistrust and so they didn't want to they didn't trust us to file um as, as soon as we we could again i don't know why but you, anyway that's in that's, the oj I case the reasoning. and you so literally and so had him red-handed and i think it was a turning point in the oj case you literally had him red-handed you caught him red-handed yeah. he was bleeding from his knuckle <laughs> with a bandage wrapped around his left left hand, one of the fingers of his left hand. I mean, you literally caught him red-handed. There was one bloody glo glove at her house, Bundy, and one bloody glove at his house, Rockingham. There was blood all over his white Ford Bronco, which had been parked back at his at his house, Rockingham. Uh, you could right. see it smeared inside and outside. The, the limo driver who'd been waiting to take him to the airport that night didn't see him. He rang the doorbell. Nobody was there. Then suddenly saw a figure that looked just like O.J. Simpson running in the back uh, of the house. His his tenant, Cato Kalin, heard three thumps, very loud thumps, which is clearly O.J. reentering the property uh, right after the time of the murders. You know, the blood evidence in his bedroom uh, of hers and his. I mean, it's like you, you couldn't have asked for, you know, a stupider criminal. Um, but again, they played the race card. And I feel like now, in 2022 America, don't we have a better appreciation for how that can work, how powerful it can be, and how people can use it to completely ignore seemingly unignorable facts? Oh, absolutely. I think everybody's a lot smarter, but I will say this. Back then, I was trying cases downtown for about 10 years. And in the downtown court, as opposed to the branch courts that were in, like the suburbs, um, we were used to seeing the race card being played. That was a very common tactic and, and it worked. Uh, it, it worked more often than you want to know. So it was not unfamiliar to me, but this was a level beyond because he was so famous, because he had the imprimatur of this wonderful icon, this amazing guy. Um, we were fighting against that as well. And then there was also, I think, a sense of we're not going to let you take him down. 
because he is a symbol of success. He is a symbol of overcoming all the obstacles that minorities do and have to, to succeed. So there was a huge, like this impenetrable wall of, um, we don't want to, we just don't want to. Yeah, we And just I think, don't it, want to. you know, it also had to do with the rulings in court. Look, I think in another, with another judge, with a different set of, of circumstances where you really enforce the law as it's written, you wind up with a hung jury, probably, probably. But mm. I don't think anybody in the DA's office, even most of us knew at best we'd get a hung jury. Uh, that was the most that could be hoped for. And probably if we retried it, hung again and then dismissed. So, I mean, I think that was kind of in the cards from early on and became more and more apparent as time went by. Was there a change of venue, right? Because this happened, was her house on Bundy in Brentwood? I know he lived in Brentwood. Was she, was she in Brentwood? Did the murders happen in Brentwood? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I think she was in Brentwood or on the border of. But the problem was we could never have taken the case to Santa Monica because it was earthquake damaged and it was a security risk. And people were escaping from Santa Monica, like the custody bus would pull up and the beach was right there. And so it happened more than a few times that they would get out the bus and run. And so if you can't secure a building when you have a high profile case like this, you have to bring the case downtown. And they had a a special floor, the ninth floor, that had surveillance cameras in the ceiling that were being monitored by the sheriffs inside the courthouse uh, constantly. And in a case like this, that was going to be high profile and going to be such a security risk, which it really was, there was never a chance of filing it anywhere but downtown. So Mm -hmm. there was no, it wasn't even a discussion. It wasn't even a thought. Different jury pool uh, when you when you go to L.A. proper. And uh, just a couple of years after after Rodney King, the beating of Rodney King, which was very public. And the white officers were acquitted in that case, which led to the riots and a lot of bad blood. And I think most people have acknowledged that at or around this time and certainly around the Rodney King beating, there was there was a serious problem of racism within the ranks of the LAPD. So this was not imaginary. And the black community had every right to be distrustful, angry. You know, there's a second question about whether OJ was really part of the black community, which we can talk about. But just dealing with, you know, the actual community, they did have very good reason to distrust the cops. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. When the Rodney King verdict happened, it was somebody I was friendly with who was trying that case. And I and he was devastated. Yeah, and it was shocking. It was a shocking verdict to me. And it was to all of us in the office. I mean, and I, I actually reminded the jury, you know, we lost that case. Uh, we tried that case. We meant yeah, you to tried. put, you know, and unfortunately, I, it, this, the sentiment was at the time, and this had, I think, a lot to do with the feelings among the jury pool at the time of, we were picking a jury for the Simpson trial, that, yeah, you can't trust the police and, and they band together. And then you have the kind of the, the us versus them mentality because the white jury acquitted these officers who were shown on videotape. Uh, it was it was one of those situations where it, it couldn't have been stacked more terribly in terms of polarizing the community. And it was a very tough thing. The irony, of course, was that in the O.J. Simpson case, the police officers were the ones that had the hardest time believing he was guilty. One of the reasons I think they were they didn't want to bring him in uh, for me to file the case and didn't want to uh, put him in custody as they were still having a hard time. They were still struggling with b- the belief that he could have done this. And so when they came out with the theories of conspiracy and planting evidence, et cetera, I think these guys, are you kidding me? It's the last mm-hmm. thing they wanted to do. They didn't want to believe it was true. He was their hero too. So yeah. it, it w- there were and ironies to have them over. ironies. He used to have them over to his house. Like he was yeah. chummy with the cops. Like they, they knew him as a celebrity and a great guy and, and not... They, they they had to disbelieve their lion eyes when they saw all the blood evidence and so on. But yeah, so that was a major factor for you. Ultimately, um, at trial in L.A., it would be, as I recall, nine black jurors, one Hispanic, or two Hispanics and one white. Is, am I correct? Didn't start that way. We lost jurors. So we had, it was a, it was a more balanced jury in terms of white and black and whatever um it was ed but but they dropped like flies under the pressure of being Mm -hmm. sequestered and all the pressure of don't watch tv and don't read the book and don't do you know it was very hard and so yes ultimately i think that was the makeup of the jury as you've described it it wound up being that 
Mm, yeah. So that was, boy, you can see the setup for an uphill battle for you and Chris Darden. And indeed it was, despite massive evidence. Um, and of course, now we have a civil jury in a separate case saying, indeed, he murdered them both, as any sane person knows. Okay, uh, stand by. We have much, much more with Marsha Clark ahead. We're going to get into the trial. We're going to get into Chris Darden, Johnny Cochran, the gloves. If they don't fit, you must acquit and all of it. Um, and then we'll talk to her later in the show about what she thinks about crime enforcement today in L.A. This guy Gascon not going to get recalled after all. Does she have thoughts on that? Stand by as we go deep with Marsha Clark. Don't forget, folks, you can find The Megyn Kelly Show live on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon east and the full video show and clips by subscribing to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Megyn Kelly. We're almost to 500,000. Please help us get there. If you prefer an audio podcast, you can follow and download on Apple, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast for free. And there you get our full archives with more than 375 shows. Samantha from Arcadia, California, is raving about Genucel's transformative results. She says, I love Genucel plant stem cell therapy. I've used it all over my face, under my eyes, and it cleared up the dry flakiness and even reduced my forehead lines. Someone even asked if I had work done. Nope, just Genucel. Genucel has sold over 1 million products to women and men across this country. Fine lines, forehead wrinkles, dark spots, sagging jaw lines, and even those annoying bags and puffiness gone without risky procedures. Think of it. And with its immediate effects product, there are guaranteed results in as little as 12 hours or your money back. Now, during Genucel's summer blowout, every most popular package, which is all their best products, is over 65% off. Plus, you will get a complimentary gift set with your order. Go to Genucel.com slash MK60. Genucel.com slash MK60. Six zero. Order today and get their summer essential, the dark spot corrector, absolutely free. Genucel.com slash MK60. That's G E N U C E L dot com slash MK60. And your role here, where people just decided that, you know, you fell down on the job, some people did, whereas we're kind of going through how the deck was very much stacked against you despite the forensic evidence being blatantly obvious to any fair-minded soul um w when we watch the oj simpson white bronco uh slow moving white bronco we see people cheering him uh from the overpasses that was one of the shocking things you know you you got two people dead nicole brown simpson was nearly decapitated ron goldman had nothing to do with this he was there to drop off sunglasses that she or her family member had left at his restaurant he was a waiter and it appears to have just showed up wrong time, wrong place. And um, they're cheering him. They're cheering OJ's uh, fleeing the police with a gun to his head. I mean, it's just it says something sick about America with our obsession with celebrity, I guess. I don't think they would have been cheering some random, some random Joe Simpson. What do you think? I agree. <clears throat> I agree. I think that's exactly right. And it's it is kind of. I, I found myself very shocked and, and very upset at seeing it. It's like, wait a minute. Um, he's not, you realize we didn't just announce that he rejoined the NFL. You realize right. that he is actually being accused of a double homicide, a hideous double homicide. Why are you cheering? You don't even know what the evidence is. And it did strike me that it was just, it was really kind of a, a mentality of, I don't care. He's famous. I like him. I love him. Um, I remember all the great things he did with, as a player, and I remember Naked Gun, and I remember, you know, that sort of thing. And they didn't mm -hmm. care. And and it, yep. it felt that way to me largely throughout the trial, that these two poor victims were basically dismissed, ignored, and, and thrown away by so many who just, who only cared about the celebrity. And now, don't get me wrong. There were millions who did care and came out to show their support and, you know, wore the angel pins and really understood that they were, this is a homicide case. This is not about, uh, the Hall of Fame for the NFL player of the year. But there were many who didn't see that there were two victims involved here. And it felt like we were always pushing that boulder uphill to try and remind people of what this was all about. What, why we were here today. The cameras are not in the courtroom because he just scored the winning touchdown, you know, and that it felt very hard to keep people focused on that. 
again, I, let me say, not all people by any means yeah. and many, many who understood the difference, but there were quite a few who didn't care. But a shocking number who who were against the prosecution. And I know you wrote in the book about how your lines were ringing off the hook at the DA's office from people supporting him, mad that yeah. you'd brought the prosecution. I mean, it's just like, it's so crazy to think about it. But yeah, I mean, that we're still divided on the verdict. We certainly were divided on, you know, black and white reaction to the verdict and so on. Um, that became a part of the case as well. Meanwhile, OJ had been c- accused by Nicole of domestic violence in the past. He had one sort of slap on the wrist uh, encounter with law enforcement as a result. As I understand it, that's where Mark Furman first had his encounter with OJ. He, he had been called to the house on one of those. And as you say, one of the 911 calls reflects an angry OJ. This is how you guys chose to open your case to try to convince the jury I mean, to try to shake some of this imagery loose. He's not just the juice from the Hertz, Hertz commercials and the Heisman and all that stuff. This guy has a very violent side and it tends to get unleashed on his wives, his domestic partners. And here was evidence of that. Just stay on the line, okay? Is he upset with something that you did? Mm, it's terrifying. Horrifying. And, Marcia, and think it, about this. This guy is big. Mr. Simpson is over six foot, uh, you know, burly, big muscles. I mean, you know, this is somebody who is a very powerful, very, you know, imposing figure. And this is the guy who's yelling and screaming at you and, a, and raising a fist. And the fist is as big as your head. Um, and, and I hear Nicole in there responding to the dispatcher who's saying, stay on the lane, stay on the line. And, you know, all she wants to do is run and hide, which, by the way, she frequently had to, to get away. And it's it, what a terrifying situation. She's, as Gavin put it, uh, Ron Goldman was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And Nicole was in the wrong place for a long time. And, mm. you know, she kept getting kind of short trip from law enforcement. You know, he, they, she would call the police. They would show up. He'd sign a football and they'd walk away. And mm. even Mark Furman was called to the house because, uh, she was sitting in the car and the, and OJ Simpson took a baseball bat to the windshield and smashed it in front of her. Terrifying situation. And Mark Furman showed up and saw the, smashed windshield and simply wrote him what we call an FI card, field identification card, no arrest. Um, You know, this happened again and again and again. And the reason was because he was a beloved figure by the police as well. And they Mm -hmm. didn't want to believe it either. And of course, domestic violence was not taken seriously back then. Um, Crimes against women not taken very seriously back then. And it uh, that in that sense, I think things have gotten better. Not perfect, but it's getting better. Uh, but back then it was very easy for people to sweep things under the rug. And so women frequently did abandon the case and recant their statement because they couldn't expect to get justice uh, in, in the courts. So and you're poking I, the bear. I understand. <laughs> yeah. So you're not going to get a result and you're poking the bear. You know, we were talking yes. about earlier, my own research yes. and does one get a temporary restraining order? Because I remember reading a case where a woman got a temporary restraining order against her stalker. And again, to your point, your stalker can be your ex-husband or it can be a stranger. And the next thing you know, he stabbed her and the TRO was in between the knife and her chest. Yeah. And so it can be it can be very aggravating and it's dangerous for a domestic violence victim of any kind to bring law enforcement in. Sadly, it is. It's dangerous for them. It has to be a calculated decision. And mm-hmm. so she's oh, done yes. it a number of times. She hasn't, no real result has happened. It infuriates him more. Um, and so, yeah, you can, you can understand. But but she did, she did more than just that. The, the pictures, I will never forget you saying to the jury while well, you had shown them her, her bruised face. Um, 
And this is before the iPhone. I know people think about the Johnny Depp Amber Heard thing and they think Amber may have faked those photos. I have no idea what Amber Heard did. But Nicole Brown Simpson didn't fake those photos of her bruised and bloody face. And there wasn't even a suggestion otherwise. And she, I'll never forget you saying to the jury about her will, her will. And you were saying, who does that at her age? Who goes and does a last will and testament and puts it in a safe box in the bank with her bruised face photos? Like, she's trying to tell us something from the grave. Yeah, exactly right. And as a matter of fact, we have now changed the rules of evidence to allow for the admission of these kinds of statements that are, you know, I I know he's going to kill me uh, or writings that are, you know, in a journal. I know he's going to do this. Um, She had written quite a few things in her journal about the abuse that she suffered and about uh, her belief that he was going to kill her. She was aware of it. Denise was aware of it. Um, Now we, we do get that kind of information before the jury. But yeah, I mean, it was a very telling thing. It was very clear to me she was writing her own epitaph. Mm, My God. The one of the unfortunate pieces of the trial, and you made a reference to it earlier, was the judge. Judge Lance Ito was a disaster pretty much on every front. I mean, he he became a national laughingstock afterward for good reason. And one of the things that was rather irritating, I mean, it wasn't his main failure, his, you know, we'll talk about his main failure, but one of the things that was very irritating about Judge Ito was his treatment of you versus his treatment of all the other lawyers in the courtroom who happened to be male. And I'm not somebody who's constantly waving the feminism card and I, and you are never somebody to play the victim. I've read and seen your interviews for years now, but there's no question that he was a prick to you. (laughs) <laughs> and I, you know, without evidence of what the other reason was, I think it, I think he was a misogynist. Yeah, I agree. I do agree. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Megan. Um, <laughs> I have to say it was, you know, it was a remarkable thing. It, it, it kind of made me laugh because I bigger fish to fry. Right. I mean, really, we have yeah. two victims here. Um, but it was one of those ridiculous and very obvious things. Mr. Cochran, Mr. Darden, Marsha. <laughs> what? Wait, what? Gross. And, and, you know, the remarks about my hair and skirts and whatever. It was a horrible, you know, example of a male on the bench. There are so many good judges. And there were, you know, I was really hoping to get one of them. And it was unfortunate that we wound up, and this is the hard part, when you, what we call lay paper, when you uh, peremptorily challenge a judge, you only get one. And there were others who could have been worse. So when we talk, when Bill and I talked about, well, what do we do? Do we accept Lance Ito or not? He said, well, I think he's okay. And he had had Lance on his um, case against Keating. Well, Bill's a man. Keating was kind of the devil. It was not the same case, uh, not mm-hmm. the same situation as the Simpson trial. So there was that. But really far and away, what was worse to me was the manner in which he he run ran the courtroom, which is to say he did not. He handed the reins to Johnny Cochran, and Johnny ran with it, um, which is why when people say, aren't you angry with the defense and the way Johnny ran the case? I said, no, I, I'm not. He The defense will always take advantage to the greatest extent possible. They're representing their client. And if you have a judge who's inclined to let the defense rewrite the rules of evidence and the rules of trial procedure, uh, you're screwed because... The judge is the final arbiter. He had the power to prevent it. He didn't. Not only did he did not, but he encouraged it. And he made some of the most outrageous rulings I had ever seen. Uh, eventually, I did call him on it at the very end when he was going to allow the defense to comment outrageously on Mark Furman's uh, taking the fifth, which is a known thing you're not allowed to do. It has Definitely. been established. This is what we call hornbook law uh, from centuries ago you do not get to comment on someone who invokes his fifth amendment right because other you could do that and say hey he invoked his right to remain silent doesn't that make him sound guilty then why have a fifth amendment at all so Mm -hmm. they they were going to allow him to them to capitalize on his invoking the fifth and before the jury uh questioned him about it and said this is just too outrageous it doesn't matter anymore the case is lost but i can't stand it uh this is your final bad ruling and i took it on up on a writ immediately, which he tried to prevent and tried to deny us the time. And at which point I said, you're denying the people the right to a fair trial. He eventually capitulated. And the Court of Appeal wrote back immediately and said, you will not allow this. You will stop this trial because Johnny kept extending and extending and saying, we'll never rest. We'll never rest. No other judge would put up with that nonsense. Look, no other, most judges would never have allowed 
race to be made a part of the case to begin with because it had nothing to do with this trial. He didn't there kill her because she was white. You know, it had nothing to do with anything. And yet they were allowed to completely subvert justice by bringing in an issue that had nothing to do with the evidence, nothing to do with the motives or the real parties involved. So it was the worst possible situation because he himself was, as they say, a star fucker. And so he was <laughs> much more wedded to the side of the case that was famous. And yeah. it was a bizarre thing to watch a judge abdicate completely his role as the 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 captain of the ship. Yeah, and the and the neutral arbiter, uh, you know, calling yeah. balls and strikes, and not not keeping the thumb on the scale. Uh, before we get to him and the the race ruling, because that really is that was critical. Um, just a moment on you and your experience before him. You're, you you think back on how sexist we were and just openly openly sexist, uh, judging your looks at every turn. The CNN nonstop coverage, Fox News was around, MSNBC had just launched, like all these twenty four seven cable channels. At CNN and Court TV in particular, went wall to wall with it huge numbers, right? That's, of course, what you're going to do. You get huge numbers. Made stars out of people like Greta Van Susteren, Geraldo, my pal Dan Abrams was covering. A lot of lawyers up and coming became stars as a result of this. Jeffrey Tubin, that's where we first started really hearing about him. Um, anyway, so your hair, it went from curly to straight. Right? I'm trying to think. It went from straight to curly, right? That's in the middle of the trial. No, curly um, to straight. Okay, I, I, get, I get it confused, <laughs> but it, it caused a thing. It caused a thing. And I think we have a clip from the, again, this is Sarah Paulson portraying you in The People versus OJ. Yeah, here, here's a little soundbite uh, reenacting what happened. Soundbite six. You're walking in. Curly. Good morning, Ms. Clark. I think. <laughs> ah, so annoying. So that's Judge Ito choosing to sort of mock. I mean, he was obviously trying to mock your hair like you're unrecognizable and not in a fun playful way just in a you know look at you snarky. i think it's you yeah snarky while yeah. all the defense lawyers are staring at you it must have felt terrible it was ridiculous <laughs> i just i that's really what i felt it was one of those actually they they kind of flipped it in that clip you saw what really happened was i had two little kids in diapers i was I decided to do a perm because I wanted wash and wear hair. I didn't want to have to blow it out. I didn't want to be bothered. And then it grew out. The perm grew out. <laughs> and, and the um, media the uh, media coordinator at um, the DA's office said, you need to get your hair cut. And the, my hairdresser said, stop with the perm already. <laughs> You're not, you have straight hair, stop perming it. And I said, I can't stop now. I All I want to do is make it easy to deal with. He said, okay, then I'm going to cut it. So it got shorter. But the change came and he made, you know, made the remark that he did because at some point I didn't have time to go to the hairdresser to reperm my hair. It's growing out. It's naturally straight. I had no choice but to then blow it out and just let it be straight because I couldn't go back <laughs> and get another perm. So I go into court thinking, ah, no one will notice. <laughs> and who cares? Like, what judge? And who cares? Takes, yes. Yeah. Who takes cares? The time. And then that. In no. the middle of a double murder trial. I mean, I will yes. say for our listening audience, because we're, we're airing live on Sirius XM Triumph channel right now, Marsha looks amazing. She's got her hair is long and it's beautiful and it's straight right now. And I, it is impossible that you're 68 years old. It is impossible. I don't know what you've done, what, what kind of magic juice you're drinking, but I want it. I want it tomorrow. We'll talk later. Um, so in any event, that was just one example, but I, and I mentioned, I do want to mention this is I, I, you became a, a hero to a lot of working moms, single moms. You're going through a nasty divorce, custody dispute. Your husband ratchets it up while he sees you on trial in the most stressful trial of your life, of any prosecutor's life ever. So he wasn't being very kind to you. You did not want to lose custody of your two young boys. And you had told Judge Ito at the beginning of the trial, I, this is what time I can work until. I'm a single mom. I, I work very hard, but this is what time I need the trial to wrap. I was like four o'clock or four, five o'clock in the afternoon. And one day he was going to let it go late into the evening. And here again, 
is um, this is the actual you, I think, right? I'm asking my producers. Yeah, this is the actual you because Johnny Cochran later convinced you because you went to him and you're like, I'm leaving. I'm leaving at four as we agreed. And he's like, okay. And then Johnny Cochran accused you of using your children as an excuse the next week. He didn't like how the ruling had worked out and he thought you were manipulating the court. And boom, here's Marsha Clark soundbite five. I'm offended as a woman, as a single parent, and as a prosecutor and an officer of the court to hear an argument posed by counsel like that, Mr. Cochran, today. Some of us have child care issues and they are serious and they are paramount. Obviously, Mr. Cochran cannot understand that, but he should not come before this court and impugn the integrity of someone who does have those considerations. And I'm deeply offended. That is ballsy in 1994 or 95. That was a ballsy thing to do. You know, I mean, I think I was just so pissed off, Megan. I didn't, there were there were moments during that trial when I said things that I really meant. And, um, you know, <laughs> which figure. is rare, you know, on a personal <laughs> level, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> that sounded so bad. Please no, no, I know what you mean. that. It's a bad soundbite. <laughs> but I what totally I meant is you don't talk about yourself on a personal level when you're in court. Um, in terms of how you feel about the case. He talk about it legally speaking. I think he's guilty. I think the evidence shows this. I think this is irrelevant or this is relevant. But to have to talk about yourself on a personal level is a rather uncomfortable thing. And I was never in the position to have to do that before. So I was kind of angry on both levels. Why are you doing this to me? And why that, that I should even be talking about myself as a person in this context when we have two dead victims is outrageous and should not be allowed. And his comments should not have been allowed. I get why he did it. Um, I don't think it worked for him ultimately. I, I think that uh, he didn't do it again, but it was mm-hmm. a very upsetting thing to be in the limelight, in the crosshairs that way. It's one thing to impugn me as a prosecutor and say, you know, she, she, the argument's lousy, it's weak, whatever. I don't, I disagree with her view of the law, but to go after someone personally like that, that was not um, kosher, to yeah. say the least. And then, just so the audience knows, in the midst of all this, the ex-husband's mother, your ex-mother-in-law, released topless photos of you. Now everyone's Googling it, Marsha. Um, in San Tropez, <laughs> which like years oh. earlier, right? It's like, see Marsha Clark's breasts. You know, like the amount of shit being thrown your way outside of the courthouse is truly like, it's amazing. But I love it because you are so strong and and you never let him see you sweat and you had a higher calling that you were devoted to. Uh, and I'm sure your sons are very proud of you. I think it's two boys. Um, in any event, I feel for you as a woman in today's day and age and who was, you know, coming up behind you. I, I appreciate how you dealt with it all. Okay, let's get into the trial a little bit because you mentioned Judge Ito's ruling on race. And I think most people are like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't we be talking about race? Furman was the lead cop, one of them. He's the one who found the bloody glove at OJ's house, which was a critical piece of evidence. And Furman got caught on tape saying the N-word a bunch of times. Why, why wouldn't that be relevant? The defendant's black. So, yeah. So, so here's what happened. Initially, nobody knew that Furman had said all these really messed up, horrifying things. No one knew about that. Um, what we did know was that he was the one who found a very damning piece of evidence. He found the bloody glove that matched the one at Bundy under the air conditioner at, uh, on the sidewalk of, um, so at the side of Simpson's house. And I mean, that really tied him directly to the crime and uh, to the murders. And so they were going to have to discredit Mark Furman somehow. Well, it was very hard to do because the truth of the matter is there were about 15, 20 cops at the Bundy scene before Mark Furman even showed up because the patrol cops show up first. They come, they secure the scene and the detectives show up later and they start to guide things, you know, and, and, and decide what they want to look into and how to, which evidence they want to gather, et cetera, et cetera. So by the time Furman got there, at least 15 cops had said, I was at Bundy. There was only one glove there, only one glove. And they, they were trying to sell the notion that Furman showed up, found two gloves, and moved one of them to Rockingham to frame O.J. Simpson. Okay, it's a crazy theory that makes no sense. There's no evidence to back it up, nor ever could be. And so when they wanted to, I said, look, if you can prove 
that it's possible for him for there to have been two gloves there and and for someone to have then secretly moved one of them both of these things by the way impossible to prove because it never happened but if that were true then Furman's bias and inclination to someone that he arguably like because of his race I understand okay there's motive to do something terrible and frame someone but if you can't if there is no evidence whatsoever no possibility that there was ever a second glove at Bundy that could have been moved then what is the relevance of his motivation there's none because he couldn't have there he could not frame him so no matter how he may have felt about Simpson it's irrelevant that was true and initially the judge ruled in our favor and said no there will be no evidence of race because there is no evidence that he could have, there was a second glove to move. And then the pundits came out roaring. I can't remember which ones, but, you know, screaming about how this is not fair. You can't keep race out of the picture. It's not, it's highly relevant. You're trying to skew this in favor of the prosecution. And the next day, capitalizing on that tidal wave of um, media coverage, uh, Effley Bailey basically just got up and screamed at the judge, adding no new evidence and, of course, not being able to prove anything like the possibility of a second glove existing at Bundy. He never even came close. And the judge just reversed himself and said, mm -hmm. OK, I'm going to let it in. And that's where it stood. And was that the argument that you just described over the author who had Furman on tape? She consulted with him. She was writing a book about crime and she had Furman on tape using the N-word. Was that was that? argument as you just described it over her book evidence i mean her tape evidence no her she came out way 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 later at that yeah, time okay. it was really only about a couple of people not very many one or two that were saying i heard him say the n-word when he arrested mm -hmm. me when he talked about something one was an arrestee and one was not it wasn't a whole bunch it was that kind of thing it wasn't until months later, and we're talking nearly the end of the, the trial, that this woman came forward to say, um, I've been taping my sessions with Mark Furman, and here are the tapes. He was using the N-word and talking about abusing uh, African-American men uh, repeatedly in his exploits as a, as a detective and as a patrol officer. And no one knew about those tapes until she came forward. And the defense, and she went for, she came forward to the defense. I, I do know that the Hollywood writers, because she was hoping for a, a career in Hollywood, and the Hollywood writers band together and said, "You will never work in this town," and um, she never did. Hmm. But her, but her tapes certainly came into evidence. I will say that, and it was one of the most horrifying uh, days I'd ever spent in court, mm. uh, listening to the filth that was on those tapes. It was just devastating ugly ugly stuff of of a critical witness for your side yes. critical yes. you know and with the with the racial charge already behind yes. you for all the reasons we've discussed my god this was the last thing you needed so yeah. what what do you make of Furman now i knew him at fox news uh we used yeah. him for commentary on the missing case of this baby lisa and i found his analysis he was a fox news contributor to be so insightful and so interesting there was no racial element at all in this case it was just a detective calling it as he saw it and there was definitely some pushback some people didn't believe fox news should have hired him as a contributor um but what do you what do you make of him oh, he, i have mixed bag the, he's a good detective he did good work he he knew what he was doing. He knew how to guide an investigation. He certainly was telling the truth about his role in the Simpson case. Um, and I and I say this because it was corroborated by at least a dozen other officers uh, about what had happened that night, what they found, and how they found it. So there's that. Um, and I would not ask anyone to take his word for it, having heard the tapes and heard what he has said and done. Uh, but he, his word was corroborated and he is smart. However, you know, the, the fact that he did not tell us that he had been recording these, uh, tapes with this author and he knew it's not something that he forgot. In fact, on those tapes was a meeting he had with her after the case broke, after he testified at the preliminary hearing on the Simpson case, oh, wow. talking about those tapes 
and talking about how he was going to capitalize on his role in the case and she was going to write this book and uh, that sort of thing. So it's not as though, oh, I made these tapes a million years ago and forgot. He mm. was very well aware of it and it was ongoing. Um, so I, I have to say the fact that he did not tell us and 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 therefore hid it from everyone made it so much worse because it, at least I could have said, OK, look, we've got these tapes. He will yeah. tell you himself, and so will she. I don't know that any of this is true. By the way, apparently that was investigated. All the incidents that he was supposedly was involved in were never proven to have happened. And he was embellishing for the benefit of this author uh, who wanted lurid stories, and he gave them to her. Mm, so, right. you know, right. as, as a person, I don't have a lot of respect for Mark Furman. As a person, I think um, his attitudes about African Americans, about minorities, about women, uh, are disgusting and really horrifying. But uh, as a detective, he was able to do a good job and did do a good job, actually. Wow. My God, I can't imagine what it was like for you sitting there that day. Of course, it wasn't the worst day of the trial. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, that was the gloves and the later. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. That wasn't your call. When we come back, Chris Darden and the role he had in forcing OJ to try on those gloves, which was a move both members of the prosecution team would live to regret. More right after this quick break. So the idea, you mentioned Bill. Bill thought Ito would be okay, but Bill wound up having a heart issue and taking leave from the trial. In came Chris Darden, the partner that we would all watch every day right next to you. And as has been documented and admitted by you and Chris, it was his call to have O.J. Simpson try on the gloves. Now, I'm confused after having read um, about the glove issue. When he put on those gloves, was he putting on the actual gloves from the crime scenes, like from Bundy and Rockingham? Or was he putting on a model that the glove manufacturer had sent to you guys, like an identical model, supposedly? Yeah, so he did both. Um, so they did. They proposed the defense proposed that he try on the actual crime scene gloves. I objected on the record, saying they have shrunk, they've been tested, they've been frozen, they've been unfrozen. These gloves were bloody. They, there's no way they're in the same condition. And then, um, and then Ito said, and well, but he's got to wear. He's he's ruling for the defense, allowing it. I said, well, but he, I was objecting. And then he said. But of course, he's going to have to wear latex underneath because these are bloody gloves. So he has to put on latex gloves and then put the gloves mm. on top. And I said, now it's completely irrelevant. Now you'll never know if they, that, you know, that's not going to be the same fit. There's no way they can fit the same way. The gloves are not the same. You put in latex underneath. This doesn't work. Um, Chris insisted that if we don't do it, they will. And I said, then let them. And we can tell the jury exactly what we just said. You know, that their latex is underneath, the gloves are not in the same condition. Uh, we can't do this. This is a stupid experiment. It's it's irrelevant experiment because you can't duplicate the conditions. And we saw what happened. Yeah, we all saw what happened. When I was at well, NBC, well, I had... Well, let me just, I'm sorry. Let me just add one thing. After yeah. that, then I, I said, you know, let's have the expert get the actual gloves in their normal condition, the way he actually wore them that night where he won't have to wear latex and it won't have been shrunken and frozen and shrunken. And then he did put those on and they fit. Yeah. And no one remembers that moment. That moment. No. The, right, the cleanup <laughs> in aisle seven uh, doesn't yeah. play as well as the spill. Um, so I had Chris Darden on my show at NBC and I asked him about the effect this trial had on him. And it was sad. It was profound. and It was kind of sad. And here's just a little bit of that. Is that true? Do you feel this trial ruined your life? Well, it certainly changed it, and it certainly you know, changed the direction of it, and uh, it took me to places I rather would have rather not gone. How so? Well, because you know, we, owed a, we owed a debt. Uh, we had a commitment you know, to, to the Goldman family and to the Brown family to bring the murderer of their son and brother to justice, and we failed to do that. And... You know, you don't lose something like that and then just forget about it. It's not, it doesn't just roll off your back. Mm -hmm. Can you relate yeah. to that? 
Sorry, you're there. Can you yeah. relate to that? Because I, I know I read in your book, it was it actually struck me. You said your reaction upon the verdict, of course, he was acquitted, was you felt guilty. You felt guilty. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, our job is to convict the guilty. Our job is, I mean, if you can never call it justice, getting a conviction when these people will remain dead. Um, but it is all we have. And that's what we're supposed to deliver. And we didn't. And so I think um, both Chris and I will remain scarred by that forever. Mm. Well, I hate that. I mean, all you can do is your best. All you can do is give it your all. You know, you can't, in no trial, are you secured the verdict you want? I mean, with time, has it, have you gotten gentler on yourself? Yes and no. I mean, at the time, and it, there was a there was a sense that we couldn't win this case very early on, way before the gloves, way before the author came out with the tapes, all way before then. You could see the way it was going. Um, and I thought at, to myself, regardless, then the only thing I can do is do everything, and that means spare no effort, work day and night. Um, you know, so I would go home to be with the kids, but I brought the work with me, and when I put them to bed, I I was working. You know, at home, and so. The, the one thing I can say is that I did not spare any effort. There was, I, 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 I did everything I could think to do, worked as hard as I could possibly work to bring the case, if not to the jury, at least to the rest of the country, um, to see that this is the truth. We're presenting the truth here. He did do this. And at least I'll have that. And so I do have that. I know that we fought as hard as we could fight. We all worked as hard as we could work. And so that is a measure, I guess, of comfort. But at the end of the day, the truth is we did not succeed. And I feel like Chris does that we did owe it to them. We owed it to everyone to see that justice was done. I think it's, it's uh, something that is felt not just by the families, but by everyone watching. You want to see justice prevail. And when you don't, you lose faith. You know, it makes mm -hmm. you feel like you can't trust our system of justice. And that's a terrible thing. So mm -hmm. we cannot help but carry some of that with us probably forever. I don't see it like that at all. I see, you know, the, the jury let us down. The jury had a different motivation. I understand there were definitely some holes in the case. If you believed the defense's DNA um, evidence, you you could get to this. You could get to this result. But unlike... I mean, you, you tried, you saw, you tried to present the clear picture. The jury got mesmerized by Johnny Cochran and the so-called dream team. And I think they had other preconceived biases going in there with all due respect to them. I'm sure they did their best, but at least one has come out since and said he, he would have changed his verdict. He thinks Simpson did do it. And now having like seen the case with fresh eyes, um, I have to ask you about if I did it, OJ Simpson, shortly after I joined Fox news in 2004, O.J. Simpson through HarperCollins, which the, the Murdochs also own. So this is a story that we were debating very much internally, wrote a book with Judith Regan um, on sort of an offshoot of HarperCollins. And it was called If I Did It. And it was basically his confession. And it talked about how he did it. You know, if he did it, this is how. And I, I was looking at it just prior to our interview. And one of the things that jumped out at me was. Uh, there was all this blowback and it was actually never published and there was no publicity tour, but he did a couple of interviews. Anyway, he called Nicole the enemy. He talked about his outrage uh, against her when she would flirt openly with other men in front of their children. And this is just a bit at the scene of the crime. This is per OJ Simpson and his book down to meal with Kato Kalin dressed in a dark sweatsuit. Uh, he sped over to Nicole's condo in Brentwood. He parked in the alley, put on a knit wool cap and gloves, grabbed the knife that he keeps in his Bronco. According to Simpson, his intent at this point was to scare her, not kill her. Encounters Ron Goldman, sees him arriving at the condo. Simpson um, goes on to report that he accused Goldman of planning to sleep with Nicole. Goldman denies it. Nicole tells Simpson to leave Goldman alone. He was just returning glasses she had left at the restaurant. But Nicole's Akita, her dog, when it wags its tail to greet Ron, convinces Simpson that Ron and Nicole have a sexual relationship. Simpson yells at Goldman, you've been here before. In Simpson's account, Nicole charges at him. Or charges at him like a banshee, failing, falling and smacking her head on the concrete. When Goldman drops to a karate stance, Simpson loses it. And what amounts to basically a confession, Simpson writes, then something went horribly wrong. And I know what happened, but I can't tell you how. Then later, 
This is from a report about the book. In a taped interview to promote the book that was never aired on TV, Simpson, according to a partial transcript obtained by the New York Times, said, After this guy kind of got into a karate thing, I remember I grabbed the knife. Asked in the interview whether he removed the glove before grabbing the knife, Simpson replied, quote, You know, I had no conscious memory of doing that, but obviously I must have because they found a glove there. Talks about how he fled the scene, soaked in blood, holding the bloody knife. When the Cole and Goldman dead in front of him, he stripped to his socks before re-entering his Bronco. Saw the limo parked in front of his house, so entered the estate along a darkened pathway, banging loudly into an air conditioner outside of Cato Caitlin's, Caitlin's bedroom as he attempted to do so. And on and on and on. He also claimed in that book that he had a second man, a friend named, quote, Charlie, with him at the time of the murders. This must have been stunning to you. Forget the propriety of the publishing and all that. But the fact that he wrote this down and kind of told us what he says happened. What did you make of that? I didn't make anything of it, to be honest with you. I don't believe he wrote it. Um, I don't. I think that someone else wrote it. And I do know who. Um, he had a lot of good guesses about what happened. Some are obviously wrong. Uh, Nicole did not fall and bang her head. Nicole was taken down um, brutally by him and basically uh, rendered uh, unconscious by the time Ron showed up and then had the fight with Ron and then went back and finished her off. Um, there was no Charlie because that crime scene went over with a fine tooth comb, no evidence of any other person there. And you had the blood drops next to the bloody shoe prints showing one person leaving the scene, uh, no one else present um some of the other things were true i i don't i think that what he I, i'm not sure why he did this book um i think the, you know there was obviously a profit motive yeah. uh, which i hope the goldmans have made unworth it to him but um uh, i really just I, I just thought it was kind of a work of fiction written by somebody else and something that he signed on to that he probably regrets uh otherwise you know, there's very little truth to be found there. You know, what's crazy. Of course, we all saw that years later he got convicted of ki kidnapping. He was trying to, I don't know, something with his memorabilia and trying to avoid paying the Goldmans the money that they um, are entitled to as a result of their civil court verdict. He wound up serving, I think, 11 years of a 33 year old, three, 33 year sentence. I um, was serving almost nine years, forgive me. Um, but he, he actually just comments now on random things, Marsha. He, I know. my team and I noticed it after the Will Smith slap of Chris Rock. He actually got out there and and commented on it and was like, "Oh, you know, I understand. I I've been there when the media says horrible things." I'm like, "What the? What is happening? What are you doing? How is this happening? Is it? We well, lost how are our they mind. going to him for comment? Why are you asking him? <laughs> Why are you asking this guy for comment? And oh he had God. something to say about Jeff Tubin too. Did you hear that? Oh my God." No, what did he say? <laughs> what was he pro or anti tube inspiring? <laughs> okay, we'll squeeze in a quick break while we get her back because clearly this is not done. All right, we've got her back with us, and uh, we did look it up during the break. You were one hundred percent right. October twenty twenty, OJ tweeted, "Damn, Jeffrey Tubin. At least Pee Wee Herman was in an X rated movie theater." Because oh Tubin wrote. He wrote the book, The People vs. O.J. Simpson, on which the miniseries was based. My God, my God. I, I'm like, I understand people, people sin and like you move on, you forgive, you move on. No, no, this is not that case. I guess not. I mean, I think it's remarkable that people are asking for his comment. I really, <laughs> but whatever. Maybe like if a double murder takes place, you might go to him for that commentary on well, how they do what, what, Right. That he's got some real expertise in. Um, there you go. Okay. Insight. So back to this. You say in the book, we lost we lost this case because American justice is distorted by race. We lost because American justice is corrupted by celebrity. The bedrock issue here was not race, but race coupled with celebrity. So ironic because of course, as I mentioned at the top, OJ used to say, I'm not black, I'm OJ. And, right. you know, they had to, of course, change his whole house before the jury toured it to take down all the photos he had of all these white celebrities and white friends and put put up pictures with black people. So he looked like he was more part of, you know, the black. I mean, it's like a farce, right? A farce. Yeah. But 
Um, expand on that. You lost because of race coupled with celebrity. Yeah, I think you, you take one away and then you have a different verdict. You know, if he's, if he's as you said, I, I'm, you're not going to like this, but if it's Tom Brady and it's him instead of uh, O.J. Simpson, I think he gets convicted. If it's John Q. Lunchbucket and he's any other race, uh, black whatever, he gets convicted. But you put the two of them together. And I think especially at that time, and we can never talk about these things in a vacuum, it matters that Rodney King had just happened. It matters that the city was burning. It matters that everyone was on edge because of the um, the verdict in the Rodney King case. These things really make a difference. And so you have that as well. But all of that put together certainly did make the recipe for this verdict. We're now obsessed with identity, skin color, gender, uh, gender identity. And more and more, this is tr creeping into courtrooms. What do you make of that, of wokeness and identity more and more appearing in law schools, in the training of young lawyers, on the bench, and even in our jury boxes? You know, I think it's good that lawyers in particular are being taught about the ways in which race may um, impact the way law, law enforcement works, the way cases are prosecuted, which cases are prosecuted. I think to be sensitive to the in the way people do their jobs is an important thing to be acknowledged and you, because you can't address bias unless you acknowledge bias. So that's as a first, as a, as a general point of information to be aware. I think that's a good thing. That said, it cannot be allowed to take over in a courtroom. And at the, at the point when you start to pick a jury, the jury has to be told and, and the, must be enforced in no uncertain terms by the judge. We are here to judge the facts unless race is an issue. And it can be. It certainly can be. But if it is not an issue, then it will not be allowed into the courtroom because it does. These are the kind of hot button issues that distort the um, the ends of justice. There's no way you can have a just and fair verdict when you're throwing in hot button issues that simply make people upset, but have mm. nothing to do, le legally speaking, with the evidence. And so nope. call it unfairly prejudicial in a, in a court of law. Let me get to this before I let you go, because we only have a couple minutes left and I, I teased it. So I'd love to know your thoughts on the current LADA there. The attempted recall failed because they didn't get enough valid signatures, although it came pretty close. And he and other, you know, soft on crime DAs are popping up in city after city as these crime rates go up. What do you make of it? You have to be aware of what a district attorney can and cannot do. I see an awful lot of commentary that says, oh, he's, you know, the people aren't getting busted. They're letting criminals walk out the door with merchandise. They're smash and grab. Nobody's doing anything. But that's not a district attorney's job. District attorney only can prosecute the people who get arrested. So you have to look at the law enforcement level and say, do they have the wherewithal? Do they have the means to actually go after all these people? And that that's kind of a threshold issue right there. First, they have to get arrested. That's important. Now, if yeah. Gascon is also uh, promoting policies about filing cases that is too lenient, that's a different story. And that's what I was reading, that prosecutors were walking out because he was ordering them not to file three strike cases. And you can't do that. You can't do this across the board thing. Discretion has to become, has to be part of it. If a defendant has, you know, two prior shopliftings and now he's got uh, an out-and-out -out robbery, you're not going to file a three-strike case on that, but you will file it if this is his third armed robbery. You know what I mean? You have to be able to think about who you have in front of you and not yeah. just do these across the board, um, either nullification or the uh, the opposite, you know, going after everybody regardless. I'll tell you what, so. I wish we could get you back in there. I know you never prosecuted another case, but no matter what anybody says, you prosecuted a great one that in, in 1994 and 1995. I'm proud to know you. Marsha Clark, all the best to you. Thank you so much, Megan. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Tomorrow, Jared Kushner. Don't go away.